All right, now we welcome in Ella Brockway into the Minor Lounge. Back again, uh, Ella, of course, is the game day editor at the Daily Northwestern. Ella, thanks for joining. How are you doing? Thanks so much for having me. I'm happy to be back. It seems like it's been a while since not too much has happened in the Northwestern football world since I talked to you before uh, the Wisconsin game. They've only played two games, but uh, it has been a while, so... Yeah, yeah. I mean, we last talked after that Wisconsin victory. You're back home in, in New Jersey uh, for uh, for winter break, and um, you know, not a lot has happened, but at the same time, a lot has uh, a lot has happened, especially for Ohio State and Northwestern too. Uh, we kind of I, I kind of danced around the topic in the in our, in our last conversation because I, I didn't want to jinx it, and then Northwestern, of course, went ahead and and lost anyway, but. Sort of this in this roundabout fashion, we got to a Northwestern Ohio State Big Ten title game, which is kind of where we expected it to fall. But we just didn't probably expect all these weird um, <laughs> uh, paths to be taken. So, what what has yeah. the past couple of weeks been been like, just from both sides, uh, from from your vantage point? Yeah, so it has been a fascinating few weeks for Northwestern football. I think the end of the Wisconsin game, or um, the week following the Wisconsin game, with the whole you know like. When, fighting, when the Fighting Reese Davis thing took over the internet kind of for that week, and there was a whole, um, I don't know, that whole week was kind of surreal. The, the week following the Wisconsin win was kind of surreal in that, like, all of a sudden Northwestern was ranked number eight in the college football playoff rankings. And, you know, Northwestern was more or less on the national stage for, uh, for a week. And then everything kind of changed again with that Michigan State loss that was um, – the week after, but it does feel like a lifetime ago. And then, um, you know, I think that kind of tempered everyone's expectations of what, obviously after that Michigan State loss, the Big Ten Championship game was still on the table, but, um, you know, the kind of national hype or the the self-hype kind of settled down a little bit about around Northwestern. And I think that, um, you know, when Northwestern's game against Minnesota was canceled for, I think, December 5th, that was kind of a a week that both the program and the Northwestern fan base took to kind of just say, okay, let's breathe. Like Michigan state loss is not the end of the world. Every, I think the program kept saying that all their goals were really still ahead of them. And here we are nearing December 19th and they really still are. So, um, you know, I think this was, if I had sat here after the Wisconsin game with you and been like, let's try to map out Northwestern season, I probably would have said, you know, either, um, the Michigan State game and the Minnesota game, both are potentials for trip losses. Like, look what happened there. And then probably a win over Illinois and then he trips the Big Ten Championship game against Ohio State. So it has been a kind of wild past four weeks where a lot has happened. Like you said, a lot has happened, but not a lot has happened at the same time. And, you know, throw all the Ohio State happenings in there too. Um, it's been a kind of crazy weeks for the Big Ten, but uh, here we are. Yeah, and you're wearing the you're wearing the scarlet and gray right now. Um, what what uh, um, you know? What was that like? Ohio State. You know, I think they're rightfully in the championship game, but I'm kind of curious your thoughts on uh, you know where you stand on you know what the conference did and getting them in and and all the buzz around the Buckeyes. Yeah, I personally like honestly, I, like I was saying, if we were talking after the Wisconsin game, I probably would have said the same thing. I think it was clear from just how this season came about um, in terms of like bringing when the big 10 stopped and when it came back, especially and how it came back, especially due to that effort that we saw from, you know, like Ryan day from Justin Fields from the entire Ohio state program. I think I've had a a feeling that the big 10 was going to do its best and do whatever it needed to, to get Ohio state into um, not even just into the championship game, into the playoff, like more bluntly. Um, So I think I've been, thinking that, you know, even since Ohio State's had some games canceled really early in the season, you know, um, I was not surprised by the decision. I don't have strong opinions on whether I disagree or agree with the decision or what should be made. Um, You know, everything has been, especially with the Big Ten specifically, everything has been so in flux with their rule changes and what's allowed and what's not allowed that I was kind of expecting this, you know, reversal of the whole six games to play in the Big Ten Championship game uh, rule to be reversed. And, you know, I wasn't surprised. And I think it's compelling that Northwestern and Ohio State are going to face off again after two years ago. So I guess that's my my short and abbreviated take on that whole happening. Yes, I, I, you know, I would agree with you. I think they did the right thing um, just because how how dominant they've looked against most of the teams that they have played. And, 
you know, if I'm, if I'm in Northwestern shoes, I, you know, I want to beat the best. I wouldn't want to beat anybody else in the big 10 uh, title game and, and Ohio state right now, you can argue all day, but the perception is they're the best team, not only in the big 10, but in the nation. So um, yeah. if I'm the Wildcats, I definitely want to, you know, knock off the best if uh, you know, rather than play somebody else uh, type thing, I'm sure that you would, yeah. you would say the same thing. I fully agree with that. And I think that's what you heard out of the program a lot these last few weeks. Obviously, I don't think they would, you know, come out and be very vocal against against the Big Ten decision if that were the situation. But you have I have been hearing from whether it's Pat Fitzgerald saying that he thinks Ohio State is the second best team in the country or, um, you know, some of these the Northwestern players really saying that we wanted to play the best in this situation we wanted we're like fine with the big 10 decision and we want to be, we want to challenge the best team in the conference. And, you know, I think that's been the message from the program. And um, at this kind of stage, I, I tend to agree with that. So that's what the players and they're, they're saying they're echoing this, the same sentiments. Yeah. No, that's yeah. Yeah. I think you've heard that a lot from the players and um, especially from Pat, Pat Fitzgerald has been, um, you know, he's been asked about it, I think in the last two or three press conferences okay. and, you know, he has, he, he has very high praise for Ohio state. He says he voted Ryan day for coach of the year in the conference. Um, like I said, he said, if he had a vote for the, for the college football playoff rankings, he would put Ohio state number two. So they have very high praise for that, for, for that program. And, um, you know, I, I think they're, up for the challenge or ready to accept the challenge that this like circumstance has presented them with. Yeah, absolutely. So you mentioned it two, two out of the last three years, Northwestern Ohio state in, in Indianapolis, this is the third straight year for the Buckeyes. Um, you were at that game. I was actually at that game too in 2018. Um, what do you remember about that game? The highs, the lows, uh, what, you know, what are your memories from that game? Yeah, I think, well, my first memory is kind of not even about the football. That was my first time in Lucas Oil Stadium. And I think that's one of the coolest football venues or like professional sports venues for that matter that I've ever been in. So it's a, once things return to normal, if you're watching this or listening to it and you haven't been there, definitely put that on your bucket list. But that was my first note. But um, I think, you know, Northwestern came into that game, I think it was 16 and a half point underdog. And, you know, I don't know if Northwestern fans had, huge expectations that they would come out of that game a winner. You know, Dwayne Haskins was such a, such a beast that season. And I think Chase Young was still there. Um, like Ohio state was really talented that year. And, um, you know, Northwestern had a bunch of injuries in the secondary that kind of, you know, I think Haskins threw for like almost 500 yards, if not like 490 or something. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I remember for the, I guess the lows, um, you know, Northwestern secondary really struggled. Trey Williams was one of the starting cornerbacks and he was out. Montre Hardage was another um, another defensive back. And I think he left midway through the game. So Northwestern was sort of forced to rely on a lot of backup safeties and cornerbacks to play in that secondary. And that really hurt them down the stretch. But, um, you know, there were definite highs. I think every Northwestern fan that you would talk to who was either in Indianapolis or watching from home, we'll talk about that third quarter when they made a, when Northwestern made a comeback. And, um, I can't remember if it was at the beginning, but at some point, um, a former running back who's now medically retired, but John Moten, he ran for like a hundred yard run. And, um, you know, that was, there were definitely it's high moments, even though, um, you know, Northwestern ended up losing that game. I think a lot of people will just talk about the experience and it, it was still like fresh in a sense that it was kind of like, we are happy, obviously like the program wouldn't interpret it that way, but a lot of Northwestern fans, I think were kind of like, you know, we're happy to be in this situation where we're playing against Ohio State on national TV in prime time. Like this is a surreal experience. So I think obviously the scoreline doesn't reflect it, but I do think a lot of Northwestern fans have fondish memories of that game at least. Yeah, no, absolutely. And you hit the nail on the head. I think the third quarter, there was a time, um, I think it was Clayton Thorson had that scramble and scored a touchdown on it. And I forget, I, it went under review. I forget if he had fumbled or I think he was like ruled down and then I went to review and everybody could see that it was a, uh, you know, a touchdown. So all the purple, you know, fans in purple were going crazy. And then later in that quarter, um, I think this is where the fumble, they, you know, they completed a long pass down the field and they fumbled, you know, at like the 10 yard line, which is like 
yeah. you know, just demoralizing. And then they reviewed it again. And uh, it was a long, it was a long review, but it was very evident that the knee was down and he had possession. And so mm -hmm. for like this extended 10, I just remember this extended 10, 15 minute stretch of the third quarter when Northwestern came back, tied the game. And then, you know, there was just a party of, uh, you know, of sea of purple and, you know, there's only 15% yeah. Northwestern fans there. That's, that's kind of what I remember most about. Yeah. That, that whole, that game itself, I'm just pulling up the, the scoring summary from it now. And it was very emblematic of that entire 2018 Northwestern season. You know, they like got down early. They had like one, that one Moten run was, it came in the first quarter and, you know, it came early and they seemed kind of into it. And then they came out of halftime and scored two touchdowns and all of a sudden were had cut it to 24-21 and everyone was like, oh my God. Like that was pretty much the way that Northwestern 2018 season went from, I remember, you know, they would get down early and then stage this incredible third quarter comeback. And then, um, you know, obviously Ohio State came back and kind of sealed it in uh, in the end of that one. But that was the same kind of trajectory that followed at the Holiday Bowl that had followed a lot of those Big Ten games down the, down the stretch. So, um, yeah, I think a lot of Northwestern fans still just look at that as one of the, uh, despite the loss, one of the high points of that 2018 season. Yeah, yeah, no, I, absolutely. So what does it mean for the program to, I mean, you're in it, you're with the coaches and players, um, you know, more than me or anybody else. Uh, what does it mean for the program to be kind of back there again, especially after a three and nine year last year and, and just, just to be back and, and continue to grow their, their program? Yeah, well, it's interesting. So I said that I think there was kind of a, a wow, we're here or wow, we're kind of happy to be here vibe to the 2018 game. And I definitely think that's not the case this year, which is, really fascinating you know what we've heard from the the players all week has just been you know this is not a game that we're coming to just show that we can play a little and you know come in with the assumption that we're going to lose or be happy to be here like they want to win this one and I think you know not to discredit the 2018 team I assume they wanted to win that one too but the the messaging around the program is um you know, much more of a, we've been here before, like we know what to expect from this environment. Um, obviously it'll be different this year without fans, you know, that's a huge component. And I think part of, you know, if you were at that game or watch that game, you can remember that it was fully like three fourths of the, of the whole stadium was heavy Ohio state. So that's obviously going to be um, a little different this year, but um, I think the messaging around the program this year really is that's like, we want to win this one. We're, we're, we think we're a good enough team. We have a good enough defense, a consistent enough offense that we want to, we want to win this game. And I think that, um, I don't remember exactly. I, I just, I've been struck by that in the messaging that's been coming out of the program so far. No, that, that's, that's really interesting. And Northwestern's defense is definitely one of, one of the best, probably uh, the best in, in the nation right now. They're averaging like, 14, you know, allowing 14 point, like six points a game. And if you take out that fumble recovery for a touchdown against Michigan state on that final, final play, it's like 13.5 points a game that, that uh, opponents are scoring against Northwestern. But how does, you know, first I'll, I'll let you rave on, on coach Mike Hankowitz who announced his retirement. Um, it's been a crazy week in that department, but how does this Northwestern defense stop the likes of Justin, Justin Fields, uh, Master T, et cetera? Yeah, well, um, you know, I won't rave too much about Mike Hankwitz, considering it is, uh, like you mentioned, uh, now that he's officially retiring at the end of the season, I think this defense, some of the messaging coming out of those players, like guys like Patty Fisher and Blake Gallagher and Chris Bergen, um, especially that linebacking core this week, has really been like, we want to get Mike Hankwitz, his 400th win, kind of sent him off in, uh, in that fashion. So that's kind of the messaging that's coming out of the defense. But in terms of how do they stop Justin Field? Yeah, like I mentioned, I think Northwestern has a stronger secondary this year in that, um, in that its secondary appears that it will be healthy this year when they play against Ohio State. And I think that's a, a huge fact that can't be understated if Northwestern's secondary can, you know, stay healthy throughout that game and kind of try to limit Ohio State or Justin Fields' ability to find his receivers. I know he, uh, just from some quick analysis of his, uh, of what Ohio State has done this year on the offensive end, he kind of has two primary receivers, but hasn't really like found a consistent third or fourth target. So if, you know, guys like Greg Newsom, who's a, an all big 10, I think second team or first team quarterback, uh, cornerback now, um, guys like Greg Newsom, J.R. Pace, who have had really strong 2020 seasons so far are able to shut down, you know, guys like Garrett Wilson on Ohio State. I forget what the other receiver's name is, but if they can shut down those two primary targets, I think 
that's a huge starting point. Um, I think Northwestern has a strong defensive line, as we've seen this year. Obviously, Ohio State probably has, uh, you know, one of, if not the top <laughs> uh, offensive lines in the country um, protecting fields. But, you know, we've seen really good things so far from uh, guys like Eku Liotta and Tommy Adebaware, um on that D-line. Um, they've had a lot of success, you know, rushing the passer. And if they can put that pressure on fields, um, in addition to, you know, kind of the safeties and cornerbacks doing it on the, the back end, I think, you know, that's about all Northwestern can ask for. Obviously, it's hard to stop a guy like Justin Fields, who's going to probably be like the second pick in the draft. Like, it's always hard when you face a quarterback like that. But, um, you know, I think some of the conditions that Northwestern might be entering this this year's Big Ten championship game with on the defensive end might favor it a little bit more than, or are a little bit more favorable, excuse me, than when they were in, entering it in 2018. So um, interested to see how that plays out. Yeah, it's it's interesting um, to me because I think Ohio's, because I agree, I think the, the attitude, the feeling among the Northwestern team is, is different. I think even Greg Newsom was like liking tweets and things of that were praising Ohio State, you know, saying that they'll win and, and whatever. So I'm sure they're finding the motivation. And then, um, but Ohio State feels very similar. I mean, they just, you know, they, they kind of just reload every year in, year in, uh, year in, year out, right? Um, I guess the biggest concern, if I'm just looking at it from the onset, is uh, what does Northwestern do when Fields starts to scramble or if there's, a you know, they can't get to the quarterback, he buys time and that lets, you know, the receivers kind of work routes back or deeper. Um, and then also the escapability of, uh, escapability of Fields to be able to run. Um, do you see Northwestern kind of using a spy as, as, you know, one of the linebackers in there? What, you know, how, how do you combat that? Because against Michigan State, you know, they got burned on some, some big run plays. Yeah, I, that's been a recurring theme kind of of this Northwestern defense. It's funny, they're, you know, the top five defense in the country and they're so good. They like really lead the country in, um, you know, like interceptions, um, tackles, things like that. But the one play they've really struggled against, no matter who the opponent is from kind of the Purdue game or going back to like, I guess, the Nebraska game all the way through now is on these quarterback draw plays, you know, it was the same thing that's what really killed them against Michigan state. You know, Rocky Lombardi was finding holes in pockets to go for these, you know, like short runs on third and 10. And then all of a sudden he would get in Northwestern would be just in another hole. And, you know, they even struggled with that a little bit against Illinois. Um, obviously the defense had a great day for the most part, but Brandon Peters was able to, to get, uh, to find those holes on some quarterback draws. So I think, um, I think they might go with the spy kind of thing. Um, one of the linebackers just kind of the watching, watching fields and trying to prevent those quarterback draws um in the last uh I guess two or three weeks that's kind of been a message when we've heard from some of the defensive line guys in the press conferences they've been talking about um you know some technique changes that they're trying to to do to limit those abilities to for quarterback scrambles and stuff like that so that's definitely a huge point to watch and with um you know a guy like Justin Fields, who is so mobile on the ground, but also has such an incredible arm, you know, it's just another, another um, challenge that Northwestern is going to have to face. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree with that. Um, I mean, we'll, we'll see. It's, it's going to be, it's, it's going to be an interesting matchup. I'm, I'm really interested to see how it, how it plays out, uh, especially, you know, either a can Northwestern, you know, make it competitive and, 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 you know, make a bid at an upset, or B, how truly good is, is Ohio State? You know, I'm sure they're going to come out with hair on fire and something to prove, right? Um, everybody talking about how they only played five games and readjusting, rewriting the rule book for, for them uh, to get in the playoff. And it's all about money and brand, blah, blah, blah. Um, so mm -hmm. it should be an interesting start to uh, championship Saturday. Um, I guess – you know, uh, from off from an offensive perspective, do you feel like Northwestern has kind of found their running game uh, after that game against Illinois? Um, two two back, you know, the basically the third and fourth backs uh, had over each over 140 yards, and I think Drake Anderson leads the team on the season with like 250 yards uh, for the season, something like that. Yeah, so I think we've all kind of been waiting anxiously in the North, the program and the coaches have too for this kind of game where Northwestern's run game finally arrives ever since, you know, I think Isaiah Bowser and Drake Anderson had really good afternoons against Iowa at the beginning of the season. But since then, you know, 
there were games when they ran for 24 yards or less than 100 as a whole team. And um, they kind of flipped that script against Illinois. So I think it's – obviously, I think Porter uh, – Cam Porter, a true freshman, um, he's from Ohio, which is a fun fact. Um, <laughs> Uh, and Evan Hull, who were the both two guys you mentioned, um, the third and fourth string backs who had over 100 yards and touchdowns against Illinois. I think they're both really good runners. They're both strong um, downhill rushers. I think it's hard to read too much into the Illinois game just because Illinois, you know, came into that game with the worst passing or with the, excuse me, with the worst rushing defense in the conference. And, you know, it's tricky to read too much about how, you know, their performance against Illinois would correlate to that against Ohio State, which has the second best rushing defense in the conference and the conference only behind Wisconsin. So I think the Illinois game was definitely a promising sign that a Northwestern run game exists if if because I think there had been there had been doubts for those last three games before that. Um and I think it's really going to my main offensive thing that I'm going to watch is I'm assuming that you know Northwestern's going to try and start the game um by establishing that run, but I you know, Ohio State has such a strong rush defense that I don't know if that'll allow that. So I'm really interested to see if, if, you know, the run game doesn't work out as it wasn't working against a team like Wisconsin or even against Michigan State, um, kind of what happens when Northwestern has to turn to Peyton Ramsey and try to try to win that game in the air. Um, I think you were able to see him do that against Wisconsin. And, you know, um, he was able to, Ramsey was able to just be consistent with his throws and, you know, he doesn't have the the world's most mind, like earth shattering arm. Like he doesn't make any two uh, like specifically long throws or like fl- throws that'll blow your mind for their arm strength, but he has been consistent throughout this whole season. So I'm really interested to see how Northwestern's offense kind of adapts when I'm assuming that Ohio State's going to try to try to shut down that run that they were able to establish against Illinois. Right. And the line I were decimated on defense. I think they only brought uh, 21 scholarship defensive players uh, to that game. So it's not, it's not a fair comparison, but hopefully I, I think if you're a Northwestern fan that, you know, Hey, you have something and, and maybe can you build on that to, you know, at least a little bit to give you some balance in the championship game and then turn to Payne Ramsey, who um, you kind of just touched on there, but they have immense confidence, uh, confidence in him. Right. Yeah, I think they have immense confidence in him, like you said. Um, it's really beneficial. Obviously, he's only been here for a year. He's only played in seven games for uh, – yeah, seven um, – for Northwestern. But, you know, you're bringing a quarterback to the Big Ten championship game who has prepared for Ohio State four years in a row um, at Indiana. So the, it's not as if he's, you know, entering this conference and this uh, this Big Ten championship game never having seen Ohio State before. This He's familiar with – you know, what the Buckeyes are as a program. He's familiar with what Big Ten defenses bring. Um, I, so I think Northwestern has really big com- or huge confidence in him and what he's able to do from a consistency level. You know, like I said, he's not going to blow you away with his arm strength, um, but he is has really been reliable in terms of, you know, making those short yardage passages, uh, passages passes, excuse me, um, finding, his, finding his receivers throughout these, uh, these last two, few Big Ten games. Sure. Yeah, I, I think it makes sense, and they're going to need some balance. They're going to need their defense to play lights out. What's your formula or recipe for North that uh, for Northwestern to win um, on Saturday? Yeah, so I think it's it's like you said, they're going to need their defense to play lights out in this one. They have not faced a quarterback like Justin Fields, um, like Justin Fields this season, and um, I just think Justin Fields brings such. Uh, such talent to and such different threats to the uh, to an opposing offense that Northwestern just has not seen the like of this season yet you know it it didn't see it against a team like Wisconsin which even though they're a top 25 team and probably the best team that Northwestern's played this year like you weren't going to see Graham Mertz going off like Justin Fields is so I think you know containing Justin Fields in whatever way they can is really going to be the key for Northwestern you know Uh, keeping that secondary healthy all through this week and then keeping them or making sure guys like Brandon Joseph and um, and Greg Newsom are really able to shut down the receiving threats that Justin Fields has to the best of their ability. And, you know, um, making sure that defensive line can apply as much pressure in, in to him in the pocket. I think that's the huge part of it and probably the, the essential part of the formula. You know, this is not going to be a game where um, I just don't anticipate it being a game that's going to be like a shootout between 
two offensive powers because I don't think that Northwestern is that big of an offensive power at this moment. You know, like their offense is dramatically better than it was in 2019 when they went three and nine, but it's still not kind of a, a lights out, blow your mind style offense. So I think, you know, really managing Justin Fields and the Ohio State threat on the, the defensive end and doing as much as they can with what they're given on, on the offensive end are going to be the keys for Northwestern. Yeah, no, I, I think those are great keys. And um, it, it, it's just that they're going to have to, you said it contain several times. You said, you said that contain, contain the high juggernaut offense that is Justin Fields, that is Ohio State. And if I'm recalling correctly from 2018, that's kind of what Northwestern was able to do for, um, you know, limit the punches in the first half, kind of come back out strong in the second half. And then, uh, you know, probably – mid mid you know early fourth quarters kind of when they started Ohio State that is started pouring it on um, and, the, and the dam kind of broke so um, mm-hmm. it'll be interesting to see if they can you know be in a position late in the game to you know have an opportunity to tie take the lead whatever whatever it may be um, yeah I think it's just to add one more thing I think it's really interesting you know this is Northwestern usually doesn't play Ohio State three years in a row just with the way the the conference has uh you know folded out with its divisions and stuff. This is one of the first times in I think the last like two decades that Northwestern will end up playing Ohio State 2018 and then this year. You know, obviously Ohio State won I think 52 to three in 2019. There's not much that can be read into that game. But, um, you know, and I think Pat Fitzgerald has said this um, implicitly this week, you know, Northwestern needs to play a perfect game in order to beat Ohio State. You know, any team needs to play a perfect game in order to beat Ohio State. And there really aren't that many of them in the Big Ten in the last five years that have done it. So, um, you know, we saw that Indiana was able to come close a few weeks ago. You know, they forced Justin Fields to throw three interceptions, which is incredibly uncharacteristic of a a quarterback of, you know, his ilk. But, um, you know, I think Northwestern, both defensively, offensively, special teams-wise, like really in all three phases, um, Northwestern's going to need to play as close to a perfect game as it can um, to come out with a win on Saturday. Yeah, perfect game. I mean, it's like you you need the turnovers, like you said. You you have to be like plus two or three in the turnover battle. You probably need to hold when Ohio State does drive, hold them to like field goals and then have them miss like one or two field goals, be two of three, two of four uh, field goals. And then, you know, the Northwestern offense probably has to, you know, be methodical down the field and, and even run end pass, just move the chains, milk the clock, keep, keep the high power and Buckeyes on the sideline. I mean, it's that sort of perfection that, that you're alluding to right there. And I was going to ask about um, Pat Fitzgerald and what kind of what he's been saying this week, just about the Buckeyes and, and you kind of already addressed that, but this would, I mean, how, how shocking of an upset this would be. I mean, Northwestern's only beat Ohio state twice since 1971. So um, like you said, they don't play every year. That's just the nature of the Big Ten scheduling, uh, both then and now with the, the divisions. But um, it would be a monumental uh, upset, which kind of helps me transition into the college football playoff rankings and, and things like that. I'm sure you've seen the rankings. Uh, I'm not sure. You know, I just wanted to kind of understand your uh, your your thoughts, uh, your honest thoughts on on um, how the rankings were you know, put out yesterday, not only in Northwestern, but just in general, um, kind of curious about, about that. There was a lot of uproar. Can you repeat the second half of it? My internet just went quickly. I love you Zoom calls, right? <laughs> Sorry about that. No, 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 I heard college football know. playoff and I was intrigued, but. Yeah, <laughs> um, so I take it you saw the, the new rankings, right? There was yeah. a lot of uproar uh, about the rankings, not only almost none of it had to do with Northwestern, but Northwestern stayed the same. And then there are a lot of other teams that either moved very little or didn't move or moved down or up or, and the excuses, um, you know, just were not logical in any sense of, of the word. Um, so there's a lot of argument about that. I was just curious your, what, you know, what your thoughts were, your opinions, honest opinions were about the uh, college football rankings as they stand today. Yeah. I mean, I think, Nicole Auerbach wrote for The Athletic then a really great column this morning and she said it best you know don't if we're going to do this where you know Florida can lose to LSU and still be in the Spain or in in the position that it's in but um you know 
Northwestern can lose, like obviously those aren't apples and oranges, those two, these two losses, but if Northwestern can lose to a team and, you know, drop seven places and then never think about the playoff again, um, if a team like, you know, everything that's happening with Iowa State, like just being there and, um, you know, everything that's happening with the Power Fives, if this is how it's going to be and there is going to be this preference, um, I don't know if preference is the best word, but um, a leaning towards, you know, these same SEC East teams, like going in there, like don't call it a playoff, call it an invite, like call it an invitational. Like she said it so well in that column. And, you know, she really pushed Gary Barta um, on that college football playoff phone call the other day, uh, yesterday, I guess. But, um, you know, I'm not fully surprised. I, you know, it was, it's kind of crazy to think back to, back to November when, you know, Northwestern was way more in the playoff conversation than it is right now. You know, when it was, getting that number eight ranking, you know, I always had this, uh, I don't know, I always felt skeptical in the back of my mind that even if it were a situation where, you know, that Michigan State loss doesn't happen, um, I don't know, it's, maybe it's just my naivete, but, uh, or maybe my pessimism, but um, I don't know, it's hard to picture, picture in the current playoff situation that there is, it's just hard to picture anything, but, you know, the same cast of characters that's always in there, you know, um, Bama, Clemson, uh, Ohio State, and then kind of a fourth choice that alternates between, you know, Notre Dame, another SEC team, um, you know, occasionally like Oklahoma repping the Big 12, you know, it's like, it's just, we've been through it. I, I wasn't well-versed enough in college football at the age of like 12 to understand the BCS system and stuff like that, but so I've kind of lived most of my college football aware life or college football conscious life in the playoff system so i i I feel like this is just obviously this is like there's so much weird stuff happening with all the different seasons and stuff this year that it's we'll probably look back on it and be like yeah it was another symbol of a weird year but i also think it's just a another example of that there's stuff wrong with the way this playoff system comes about yeah yeah and and nicole arbach uh put it so elegantly uh, i actually wrote a uh, an article before the rankings even came out uh, kind of outlining hey how you know because I like doing that what what happens you know what has to happen in order for x team to get in and a lot of my scenarios had Iowa State beating Oklahoma because I just you know it's a two loss big 12 champ no matter what Oklahoma is probably the bigger brand name and they're coming on stronger at the end of the year and then uh, you know the rankings came out I was like I have to rethink this because Iowa State sitting at six is a complete atrocity, and the whole rankings was atrocity with Florida only moving down one after losing by three points. I mean, LSU and Michigan State are pretty much equals. Like, they're they're about similar similar teams, similar records, and Northwestern had to go on the road, um, you know, in an obvious track game situation. They talked about Iowa State having the best running back in the country, but – Last year, Chuba Hubbard, I covered the Big 12, Chuba Hubbard was the best, best back in the country in Ohio State, or Oklahoma State didn't get love in the, um, you know, in terms of, oh, only moving down a slot when, when they lost. Um, I mean, I could go on and on. I, you know, don't need to go on a yeah. box, but very interesting um, that, you know, yeah, it's, it's an invitation. It's, it's not playoff. I, I called them cowardly. Um, you know, I, I would wish that, you know, it's not even – getting into the top four it's just having a more equitable rankings based on what the performances have been across the country with you know coastal carolina beating byu for example cincinnati being undefeated playing more games than you know some of these sec east schools like you mentioned um i'll I'll get i'll get off here but you know what what happens if, if northwestern pulls it off we already talked about the you know the history between ohio state and northwestern being monumental uh college football upset I mean, if they, if they win and we've done all these rule changes and we've talked and propped up Ohio State on this pedestal, I mean, if Northwestern wins as a one-loss team, uh, I mean, it's silly to me that they wouldn't be in the conversation. What, what do you think? Yeah, I think that's – if that happened – well, first off, I'll say I agree that it would be a fully monumental win. I don't think there would be a – this is kind of the same conversation that we had, um, we had back in 2018 about, right. um, you know – how big of a win and how big of an opportunity it is when you play Ohio State. And I think one of the first stories I wrote when I was at the Daily was um, kind of this look back, a long look back at when Northwestern played Ohio State in 2013. Um, It was a, you know, Northwestern came in undefeated, Ohio State came in undefeated. And 
you know, it was one of the biggest games. People still talk about this, this 2013 game against Ohio State as if it was kind of the moment that had the potential to swing Northwestern into the next tier of college football. Northwestern ended up losing the game, but, you know, college game day was there. Ryan Field was sold out. It's and it always these always these games always seem to come down to like the the common or I guess the commonality is it's Ohio State you know um, I don't know Pat Fitzgerald talks about it a lot and he knows and he's fully aware that you know Ohio State is the flagship program of the Big Ten and they've been good for so long that you know if any team beats them it's uh, for the most part can be considered or has the potential to like swing the momentum of their program just tremendously and I think that was a lot of what we heard ahead of the 2018 Big Ten championship excuse me big 10 championship game yeah. um i think that's a lot of what we're hearing now you know it's it's a little more, bit more unique i think because northwestern um you know in 2018 northwestern just kind of chugged along and had this pretty good season and then all of a sudden you know they win the big 10 west and they're in the big 10 championship but there was never really that kind of same oh northwestern is like in the top 10 of the college football playoff rankings um national presence as there was last year so that's a long, very long-winded way of saying, yes, this game would be huge. And, you know, in terms of program trajectory and momentum, uh, if Northwestern were able to pull out a win. In terms of what effect that has on, you know, the playoff and New Year's Six Bowls, I think that would be a whole, that's a whole another can of worms. Um, you know, I've been reading into some of the, like, some of the knockoff effects that could happen if Northwestern were able to pull out a win. You know, I think they'd be in Right now, all the projections seem for bowls seem to have Northwestern kind of in that third Big Ten bowl. So, you know, behind Ohio State in the playoff and behind Indiana in a New Year's Six bowl. Um, I don't really know if I, I don't know, it's very hard. Like a one loss Ohio State team versus a Northwestern team that still has one loss but beat Ohio State in the championship game. I don't know how the playoff committee would read that, but I do think if that were to happen, Northwestern would be in a really good position for a New Year's Six Bowl at the least, you know. Um, but, uh, and I think a lot of Northwestern fans would, you know, it's it's so funny when we talk about this, even going back to the the playoff conversation of November, it's so funny to to see that Northwestern football is at a point where people are, you know, disappointed in the number 14 in the country ranking. And I think um, it's been, a difficult year to like temper expectations based on you know the potential that like oh my god Northwestern's in the playoff conversation how do we settle for a New Year's Six Bowl now um so I think um at the very least you know like playoff conversations aside if Northwestern would, were to you know pull out a win on Saturday it'd be in a really good place for a, for a New Year's Six Bowl yeah I, I think you're right and again I would, I would just push back a little bit I think that's the easy answer right for the committee for anybody else like oh yeah you know just slide them up to a New Year's Six Bowl but I'm trying to look at it as a you know be as objective as uh, as possible you know um, you know I have family members that, that attended Northwestern I'm obviously wearing the sweatshirt but it, you know if they somehow beat Ohio State you can't tell me that you know they're not wor more worthy than any Ohio State and then be a bunch of one, two lost teams that are ahead of them that include Iowa State, Oklahoma, Indiana, Florida, Georgia. I mean, I, I think that jump, you would see that. But again, it would take a miraculous performance, a perfect performance, a victory to to do that. I just got, uh, you know, get really hot under the collar about the, uh, yeah. the, the committee because I think the mission statement is fundamentally flawed and I, I think they, uh, they don't do a very good job of um, – you know, easily explaining themselves, but also just kind of looking at the, the bigger picture than just, you know, hey, yeah, we should do these top four. Yeah, no, I totally agree with you. And I think, uh, again, I fully acknowledge that me just saying that they would be, the committee would give them a New Year's Six Bowl and they should be happy is fine with that. Or that's like the easy answer and the pessimistic right. answer. But I don't know, just, you know, looking at A, the Big Ten came back, like no one would, I don't know if people would say it but the Big Ten came back so that Ohio State could get into the playoff and it's just especially with what we saw last night with the committee rankings and how what what this committee's focus and priorities appear to be I, I just still I guess I'll believe it when it happens but I would um I don't know I I think it'd be difficult for the committee to find to not find a way to include one of those you know bigger brand teams yeah it'll, it'll, it'll definitely be interesting uh, for sure and 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 that, I think that's my whole premise, right? The Big Ten came back, so Ohio State could potentially play for a championship. They 
altered the they, they rewrote the rule book literally to make sure they could play for a Big Ten championship, to make sure they could play for a college football championship. Um, that would be that's like my found it. That's the crux of my argument saying that if Northwestern somehow pulled it out, which I know is very unlikely. It's like five percent of the chance that they that they do it, right? But um if they did, I mean I think you have to kind of take a hard look in the mirror at at the college football landscape. So um it's very interesting and I know I, I ragged on, I'll just make one more point, and this is, I'm sorry, but, uh, I, you know, if, if, uh, if Clemson, Notre Dame, Alabama, and Ohio State, you know, Clemson beat Notre Dame, and then Alabama and Ohio State take care of business, then it's like, I think it's pretty obvious that those are the four best teams, and usually this stuff kind of works itself out. I just yeah. think, again, that's the easy answer. You're not doing the sport a, a, a service. You're doing them a disservice if you're, when you're not, when you're just expecting it to play itself out and kind of just taking the easy way out. That's, yeah. that's, that's, right. point. that's the way I see it. Yeah. Uh, been an interesting next few weeks. Absolutely. So, Ella, thank you again uh, for, for jumping on. I was surprised by the, uh, the scarlet and gray wardrobe uh, choice. And to be like, honest, I didn't even realize until I sat down with it, but at least no one can accuse me of, North Pro Northwestern bias right now. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, I'll, I'll, let, I'll let you go real quick. Where can everybody find you and, and your excellent work? Yeah, they can find me on Twitter. I'm at Ella Brockway on Twitter. Uh, that's where you'll find me tweeting Northwestern news. We got a bunch of cool stories coming out on the, the Daily this week uh, ahead of the game, so that should be fun. Awesome. Well, I'll let you go back to work covering the team. Uh, good luck to you on, on Saturday. Thank you so much. It was great to talk to you. Thank you.